I want to invite you to open a Bible to Mark chapter 11. We're going to be looking at several passages this morning as we conclude our sermon series where we've been looking at what is the purpose of the church? What is the purpose of us collectively coming together and worship and praise and serve Jesus? And we've looked at all kinds of different things that God's Word has told us that we need to be focused on and doing. So we have mercy, which is caring for people meeting their physical needs, but also meeting their spiritual needs by bringing words of comfort and encouragement to them in times of uh, sorrow and grief. We have fellowship where we get to get together as Christians and encourage one another and lift each other up and down moments in life, read and pray together and grow together in our faith so that we can go out into the world and to accomplish the next thing that God has told us to do, which is the Great Commission, that we would go into the world together bringing the gospel of Jesus to those who need to hear his comforting word of grace and forgiveness and salvation. And all along, you guys have been awesome, right? Give yourselves a round of applause. Like, you've been amazing, okay? Right? Everybody's been nodding along. Everybody's been like, go, oh, Pastor, you're doing such a great job. I get so many words of encouragement after each service. And people take the handout that I have extras for you in case you lost it and say, I'm going to pray. Our spiritual care and leadership team has been amazing. And, and having unity around this is what we should be doing. This is what God's word clearly tells us. And guess what? Today, I'm terrified. Because today, we're talking about worship, right? Now, on the one hand, worship, yeah, like, we should do that, right? That would be, that on, on the paper, that's the easiest one for me to convince you that we should be doing. You know why? Because you're already here doing it. Like, I don't have to be like, you know, we should keep on, you know, like, you know, we should, you know, next, next Sunday, it'd be a good idea. We'll get back together again and talk about Jesus and, and receive his gifts of grace and mercy. So, but here's why I, I jest a little bit about being nervous to talk about it. Because it's also the one where most of our idols come out, where we get most divisive, where we get most argumentative. And this isn't new to just our generation and, and church nowadays, right? This has been happening for a while, all right? So... Just to mess with you a little bit, right? Just we gotta re- laugh a little bit, we gotta relax a little bit, and then we can see what God's word says about worship because it might surprise you. How many of you like the organ music and, and appreciate it, right? How many of you give thanks to God that we, we're blessed with multiple organists, right? Well, we should give them a round of applause because it's, <laughs> I don't know how to hit all those keys. And I doubt any of you do either, all right? But it's wonderful, right? So did you know the organ was not invented by the church? Did did that blow your minds, right? Like, oh, we didn't invent that? (laughs) It used to be an instrument out in the world. And then in the late 900s, somebody was like, you know what we could do? We could take that inside a church. And at the at the time, it only played one or two notes because it didn't have all the pipes and everything yet. So it's like, we got one note for the song, okay? We're all just going to sing that one note together. And you know what happened? Everybody got together and go, boy, that was a great idea to take the organ from out there where they sing all those pagan songs and bring it in here to the church. Do you think everybody responded that way? No. People are like, what are you doing? That's a, that's a pagan instrument. And now all of you, if I said next week we're tearing it out, would fire me. Right? <laughs> That'd be a content. We have a voters meeting next week. That would get contentious. I'm not doing it. Relax. Okay? <laughs> but at one point in time, people in the church gathering together to worship, something that we think has always been there, wasn't always there. Something that is precious to us and enables us to worship and sing praises to God in a very special and powerful way was once viewed as this pagan instrument. Why are you bringing it into the church? How many of you enjoy the fact that there is a pew for you to sit on? 
during worship and that you don't have to stand the entire service. Yeah, a few of you, okay. <laughs> right? <clears throat> At one point, they didn't have pews. In fact, pews didn't come along until the Protestant Reformation. So you know what happened when Luther and all the rebellious Protestant reformers said, we're gonna put pews in the church so people can sit. Guess what happened? Everybody went, brilliant idea, Luther. We love you so much. No, you know what people did? They got upset. They got angry. Like, no, we've been worshiping God this. Have any of you ever said the phrase, we've always done it that way? Anybody been guilty of that? Okay, here's what I've learned. Uh, yesterday was the 11th anniversary of me being an ordained pastor for better or worse, okay? So here we go. What I've learned, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> What I've learned in those years is we've always done it that way. It means we've done it at least once in the past year, and you liked it, okay? <laughs> and at the time, when it was the first time, everybody was like, no, we can't do it. And then by the second year, it's like, well, we've always done it that way. Okay, we're very weird as humans, okay? Now imagine, though, they bring in pews so people can sit during the sermon so that God's word could be at the center of worship. But what? We've been doing just fine for the last 14 or so without pews. Who do you think you are? Now again, just to mess with us a little bit so we can kind of all get relaxed. <laughs> if next Sunday you showed up and none of these were in here and it was just an empty room, some of you are probably just going home, right? You're not even gonna say anything to me. You're just gonna walk in and Turn around. Nope, not, not today. Right? Why? Well, it's because it's, it's nice to have And you know what? Pews. Pews belong in a church. But it wasn't always like that. And people at the time got really upset. And then you know what also happened with pews for a while in church history? People began to buy pews in the church. And they would get their name on it. And guess whose pew that was? Their pew. And that literally... And they would pay a fee every month to the church to reserve that pew. Kind of gives new meaning. So most of you, you got your spots, right? That's how I can keep attendance in my brain. I'm like, eh, eh, eh. all right. And if you move, I get really confused. So don't do that to me, okay? But it gives new meaning to the idea of you're in my pew, right? Now, thankfully, that practice has gone away. See... Here's the point of bringing these things up. There are certain things that we've become accustomed to, right? Whether it's an organ, an hymnody, right, and, and different melodies that we like. Luther got in trouble because he would take bar songs and he would change the words to them, but everybody knew the melodies. So, and everybody's like, why are you bringing that song into the church? He's like, well, because you know it and you can sing along now. Right, and at one point, pews were revolutionary and caused all kinds of issues. And we could laugh about it because, like, oh, good, over a few hundred years, we finally kind of got over it. But here's the reality there's a lot of things we don't get over, right? Unfortunately, as much as we want to say the Sunday school answer that worship is about what? About Jesus. The problem is. Because we're sinners, we so often make it about myself. Not us. Who cares about what they think? Right? It's about myself. What do I like? What do I prefer? What do I get out of it? All right, one last example, because I was reading some history about church decorations and stuff, because I am that big of a nerd, okay? <laughs> the pulpit, right? So I used to stand over there because that's what I grew up with, okay? Wasn't trying to, like, shock you, okay? And then we have this beautiful stained glass so no one could see me because the light shines behind it. And, and then I came over here a few times. And guess what happened? All of you were like, so wonderful. Oh, I just, I just love it. That's great. I'm glad you like it. I'll keep standing here. It's fine. I'll, I'll stand anywhere in this room as long as you open your Bible, okay? Fair enough. And here's the deal. At one point in time, this thing called a pulpit didn't exist. 
Jesus preached while sitting down in a circle, okay? And then eventually, around 250 AD, is the first time the word pulpit is ever mentioned in the church. Some guy just made it up. He's like, you know what would be a good idea is if the guy reading the scriptures and teaching was elevated so everybody could see him and hear him. There was no spiritual thing behind it. It was just, it'd be easier to see (laughs) and hear. And so they did it. And then it took a while for other people to catch on. You know why? Because everybody went, you know what? For 250 years, the church has been just fine without a pulpit. And then... In the Middle Ages, they moved the pulpit from the center to the side so that the altar would be the center. Did you know what Martin Luther and John Calvin and all the other reformers did in their churches? They put it back in the middle. Just, I'm just saying, okay, think about it, okay? It's all right, we'll be fine. <laughs> but the reason they did that was because they were trying to make the the visual uh, reminder to the people gathered that the focus of worship is God's word. Because in God's word, we get who? We get Jesus. So as we talk about worship this morning, look, we all as humans have personal preferences, okay? And that's not wrong. What gets wrong is when you make your personal preference the entire focus and center and purpose of worship. So here's an example of how we're all guilty of this still. Ready? Ready to feel guilty? It's going to be fun. How was church today? Good so far. Thank you, Bob. (laughs) I'm feeling encouraged now. All right. That's my question. It's not just my question, it's your question, right? Anybody ever ask somebody that? How was church today? No, we can, we can squeal, you know, quarrel if we want about if that's really a bad question or not. But here's what ultimately is behind that question. How was church today? How much did I like it? Right? Did they play the music I like? Did they talk about some of the Bible stories I like? Did they serve communion or did they sing and chant in a way that I like? And so the answer to how was church today is usually what? Me focused, right? It's all about did did I like it? Because one person could say, boy, it was great. And another person could say, oh, well, it was terrible. And they did this and they did that. And the pastor just kept going, 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 going. Right? And it got very, right? It just got worn out. So, we do this all the time. We can, we can kind of chuckle about the history of, okay, they, they brought an organ into worship, and now everybody just thinks it's always been there. They brought pews in, and it's like, of course, you go into a church building, there's probably going to be pews. There's a pulpit, but it's been moved a few times. Right? And if, I, if you showed up next week and I had drilled this in over there, how many of you would be shocked? All right? So we do this all the time, though, but the way we do it more practically in our modern day with our own hearts is, how was church? Was I satisfied? Was what I want to have happen, happen? And so it's very easy to quickly turn the answer that we all know of what is worship about, Jesus, into the answer that it shouldn't be, which is, it's about me and my own desires. So before we dive into Mark chapter 11, one verse for you from Psalm 138. God is the one being spoken about. It says, for you, O Lord, have exalted above all things your name and your word. So the psalm is saying, you, O Lord, have exalted above all things your name and your word. The reason I share this is because At the end of the day, if that's what a God has exalted above all things in creation is his name, his name receiving glory and honor and praise and his word, then the center of our worship ought to be those things. That we would gather with the intention of we are here to make much 
much of the name of Jesus to sing his praises and to glorify him for who he is as our Savior and Redeemer. And we are also to be here to learn and hear from his word because his word is what gives us his grace and forgiveness. His word is what gives us life and guidance on how to follow him. All right, so turn your Bible to Mark chapter 11, very famous story of Jesus cleansing the temple. Mark 11, verse 15, they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. The other gospels of this story, and in those ones, they get a little more detail that he actually makes a whip out of some cord and stuff that he finds, and he just starts smacking people with it. So when it says he drives them out, he's not showing up and going, would you politely please leave now? We're, we're closed, right? Jesus is coming in angry, and he's literally shoving and driving people out of the temple, those who sold and those who bought. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, which is a quote from our Old Testament reading in Isaiah. And the full reading from Isaiah talks about how God's going to gather people from all over the world, both Jew and Gentile, those who are outcasts and those who are not outcasts. He's going to bring them all together into his house to worship and praise him. So according to God's word, which is above all things, which means it's above our personal preferences, it's above our personal opinions or theories, God is saying, here's what I'm going to do. I'm gathering people from all walks of life, from all ethnicities and cultures to come and worship me. That was the goal of the temple. It's the goal of the house of God, the church, to gather as many people as possible to come and worship Jesus. And so when Jesus gets into the temple, he sees that the exact opposite. Right? There's money changers and there's people selling and exchanging all kinds of goods. And that wasn't really what was wrong because the outer part of the temple was a marketplace. And that was okay. The problem is that when he's talking about there's all these money exchangers going on and there's all these people selling pigeons is what is happening is in those instances, people's ability to worship God and receive his forgiveness through the sacrifices is being interfered with. So when you came to Jerusalem for one of the big feasts like Passover, for example, you wouldn't carry with you from wherever you're coming most of the time the animals for the sacrifice because it was just it was too much effort, too much inconvenience, or you just didn't have them at your home. So what people would do is they would bring money with them to the temple, and they would exchange it, give it to the money changers, and there they would get an animal. But what had happened over time is because the people needed to make the sacrifice, they were there to worship. They had nowhere else to go. The people running the temple decided we can make a lot of money by taking advantage of them. And so they began to charge more than was needed. And so what happened is it began to make it harder and harder and harder for people to worship God the way his word had told them to, to come and receive his forgiveness and mercy through the sacrifice. And then there's this one little detail about Neven overthrew the pigeon sellers. And you're going, why does that matter? Well, because the book of Leviticus tells us that all kinds of different animals were allowed to be used for the sacrifice depending on your income level. Because God had set it up and said, no matter who you are, I want you to be able to come worship me. And the pigeon or the dove was reserved for the poorest of the poor, meaning they didn't have so they could just go catch a dove or a pigeon, and God would say, that's enough. You can come worship me. It was meant to be 
what they had done is we're going to take advantage of everything we can. We're going to start charging you even for a pigeon. So the reason Jesus gets super angry is because instead of setting worship up so that the outcast and the Israelite and the Gentile, like God's word in Isaiah 56 said, could all come and worship God and receive his mercy and forgiveness, the people of God had become so corrupt that they were making up all these barriers and rules and obstacles that made it so that nobody could come and worship God. It was almost impossible for some people to be able to come and properly worship him. So Jesus gets mad and he starts kicking them out and turning over the tables and he asks the rhetorical question, isn't this what my house is supposed to be? A house of prayer, a house of worship for all nations. So here's a better question to ask about church, okay? We often ask ourselves or ask other people, how was church today? Or how was church this week? And you have varying answers. A better question, according to God's word to ask is, who should be invited to worship today? Who should be invited to worship Jesus this week? Rather than asking a question that is focused on me and what I want to get out of it or my personal preferences or opinions, we should ask a question that is centered on God's word where he says, isn't this what my house is supposed to be? A place of worship for all nations. And the answer to Jesus' question is, yeah, all right, that's not a hard one, right? That's what it's supposed to be. So the question for us is, well, then, how do we make it like that? Now, I'm assuming many of you have heard this story before, right? It's a very famous story. And there's a couple ways you could read it. The easy way and the hard way. The easy way to read it is, well, we don't got any money changers out there. We're not, you know, charging people to worship or buy a pew, right? We're not doing any of that. We don't even have doves or pigeons in our church, right? So the easy way to read it is to excuse ourselves and go, what? Boy, they were really bad back then. <laughs> I can't believe Jesus got so mad at them. Look, look how bad their behavior was that they would, they would take God's house of prayer and worship it and turn it into something totally different. That's one way to read it. I mean, look at the story and just go, man, they were really bad. I'm glad we're not like that anymore. The other way to read it, which is the hard way, because it's the way that requires confession and repentance, is to read it in the whole New Testament, which says, Paul says in Corinthians, that you and I are now the temple temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. So that when we gather in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, when we gather, this is the house of God, right? It, it, it's supposed to be his place of prayer and worship for all nations. So here's the, the, the difficult question, right? We want to just go, oh, they were terrible, is to ask ourselves, okay, if my heart is a temple of God, the Holy Spirit dwells in me. Are there things in my heart that get in the way of letting other people worship God? Right? Metaphorically, are, are there tables in my heart that Jesus needs to flip over and kick out? Do I elevate some of my personal preferences or the way I think things should be which means this just means the way I think things I want them to be uh, above God's way. Do I elevate those personal preferences to where now, instead of just being something that I enjoy, they're now a barrier to someone else being able to worship God? That's a much harder question. <laughs> That's why we always want to read this story and just go, oh, they were just really bad back then. So I joked earlier in the sermon about all the different things that people used to fight about that we just go, yeah, that's what, you know, pews and organ and a pulpit and all these other things. 
The issue is when Jesus starts flipping over tables because his people had put up barriers to people being able to receive God's grace and mercy. He wasn't joking. And the sad reality is that we all have things in our heart that turn into idols, become way too important to us, that instead of being focused on God's mission and inviting others to worship him, we begin to fight for those idols, right? That's how disagreements happen, y'all. It's two people saying, I love this idol more than you and more than them. And it's another person going, well, I love my idol more than you and more than them. And before you know it, worship has become about us and our idols rather than about Jesus and the people who God is calling to come and worship him and receive his gifts of grace and mercy. So it's really easy to say, what is worship all about? It's about Jesus. <laughs> but there's a problem is we, we don't always live that way, speak that way, or even worship that way. Oftentimes we are like the money changers and the people with the tables and, and we need our hearts cleaned out, right? We, we need Jesus to actually come in and, and flip some tables over and, and kick our idols out of our hearts so that we can go back to worshiping him and say, this is what matters, that people worship him. Now, I want to end by telling you the three things, according to Luther, and our Lutheran tradition and denomination that are for it to count as a worship service. And some of you are pulling out pens. You're like, okay, we've got a voters meeting next week. I'm going to win. All right. So here's the answer. Are you, everybody ready? You need the sacrament. So confession, absolution, Lord's Supper. You need preaching. That's it. So you have confession, absolution, you have the Lord's Supper, you have preaching, and Luther goes, that's a worship service. Now, some of you are looking at our bulletin and the hymnal right now going, wait a minute, there's a lot of other stuff in there. Yeah. And Luther's whole point, he wrote a whole book about it, was don't ever make a law or a rule for someone else's worship. Or you say, this is the way we worship, therefore everybody else must worship the same way. His whole point was, well, if you have confession and absolution, forgiveness of sins, you have the Lord's Supper, you have Jesus with his people, and you have God's word being proclaimed, the gospel being proclaimed, that's what you need. And yeah, you can have music, and you can have prayers, you can say the creed. Isn't that wonderful, all that freedom that we have to say, yeah, we're gonna worship in this way. Now the reason I love that idea so much is not we're just gonna get rid of everything by next week and all we're gonna have is those three things is because it's a wonderful, simple reminder of what is worship all about at the end of the day. It's about Jesus, right? So what do you get in confession and absolution? You get Jesus. What do you get in God's word? You get Jesus. What do you get in communion? You get Jesus. And that's why I like that reminder so much. And there's, there's all kinds of freedom that we have sing different songs, different kinds of music, different kinds of prayers. You use the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed. It's wonderful. But at the end of the day, for you and me and for the whole world, worship is about Jesus. And he y'all. Because you need Jesus every week. You need his grace. You need his forgiveness. And you need his redemption in your life and so does the rest of the world the rest of the world needs a place where they could come and they know every single time they're going to get Jesus
They're going to get his grace, his mercy, and his forgiveness for their lives. So instead of walking out today, and I know you're going to, some of you are going to do it because you're just going to mess with me, and asking, how is church today? I want you to ask yourselves this week, instead of that question, who needs to hear about Jesus this week? Who needs to come and be able to worship him this week? Because if worship is about Jesus, then it's a place for everyone. And it's a place that everyone needs to come so that they can hear about his grace and forgiveness in their lives. Let's pray. Lord God, we give thanks for the ability to come together as your people and worship and praise you. Lord, whatever idols we have in our hearts, help us to repent of them and to destroy them and to set them aside so that we can always and continually make war about you and your redemption. And may as your people we so be in love with you and worship and pray to invite others to come and do the same so that they can learn about Jesus and his love for them. To your name we pray, Lord. Amen.